Good morning, guys. Welcome back to the channel. If you've tuned in before, I've done a lot of work with mechanical things, but today we're going to do carpentry, which is my primary business. And while these jobs may not show up as often, it's because they typically take longer. Uh, we're at my, we're going to head to my buddy Kay's house and get started on the carpentry, the finished carpentry portion of his living room remodel. So stay tuned and see what we're going to do there in just a bit. Okay, at my friend Kay's house, we're going to do some benches and shelves, floating shelves for his new living room remake makeover. This used to have this, like those old built-in drywall cubbies. I wish I had a before video. Maybe I'll get a photo on there. Um, so he had this tiled in and I'm going to cover this area with a bench top with a faux face that's three inches on the front. So it looks like a big three inch deep piece of lumber. It's going to be really fun getting these corners done. Um, got a nice little not quite 90 degree angle to work with there and just try to nest those in there nicely and then get two floating shelves above and the same thing on this side as well. We're going to do this in a white oak with a stain similar to the floor. Okay so now that we have our measurements I bought some S3S lumber from the yard and instead of planning it, because we're already at 13 sixteenths of an inch, I'm just going to use my drum sander to take off as much as we need to to get rid of the rough chatter from the uh, the rough planing they did at the mill. Because <clears throat> we don't need this to be an exact three-quarter dimension. These are going to be, this is the hardwood face of the shelves and the bench. And uh, once I get done with that, we'll get on to ripping it to size. Okay, all of these have been drum sanded at 120 grit. And that's the, that's about where I want it right now while I work the wood. It's, it's, it's pretty close to its final dimension, um, considering I basically just have finished sanding. And I don't want to go any finer than that because I'm probably going to potentially ding it while I work with it. You can see this is S3S, so we have one square side, one rough side. So the next thing I'm going to do is rip these boards into uh, just basically square planks. And then I'll get my, I'm gonna basically, I'm gonna rip three inch wide pieces from each of them so that the face of these shelves are at three inches thick. And that'll give it that look of, uh, as if the wood is a lot more solid or as if you're actually using like a three inch slab on these shelves. Before I get into ripping these boards, I wanna put a freshly clean saw blade in there. And this has been soaking in the CMT orange Formula 2050 for a few days, which helps loosen up any of the stuck on, if you have um, pitch or any kind of sap or anything that just got glued to the blade. In this case, some a little bit of everything. I even have some Trex glue probably stuck to that. Uh, this is a finishing blade from Tenryu, and taking this extra step to clean this blade is not only gonna prevent burning, it's gonna give me a glass smooth finish. And that's gonna save me time down the road so I won't have to improve that edge which also means I'm going to be saving some material in the process as well. I'm going to use my drill here with a rotary brush, and that should just take a few minutes to clean that up, and then we'll swap that onto the, sit the table. Okay, there you go. Nice clean blade. You can see how polished and shiny those carbide tips are. Your cut is only as smooth as your saw blade is sharp. So a uh, huge shout out to Childers Sharpening in Littleton, Colorado, up here in Denver area. That's where I get my blades sharpened, and I've had this blade for several years, I just basically rotate it. I, I refer to it as a finish blade, but it's actually a combination blade. It just cuts so clean that I can use it for just about everything. And it almost always comes out with a finished surface unless I, as long as I've done my part on uh, keeping up on the cleanliness and sharpening. Just a little pro tip here. You'll see how there's cracks in the lumber. When, you, when your boards are acclimating, the ends typically will split a little bit and Initially, you couldn't see any of these cracks. I could see a little indent there. So I started with cutting just an inch off and this board broke very easily. So I took another inch or so off and I gave it a stress test and it broke fairly easier, but not as hard as, not as easily as the first one. Then I got to this one here and you can see it's holding up. So we know we cut past that split and the rest of this lumber that we're gonna use has a lot of integrity up until we get to the other end, which you can already see is starting to split. So obviously we won't be using that part of it as well. And typically we're actually only using 70%, I would say, of, of the lumber that we buy, even if it's already in S3S condition and even less if it's in rough when you purchase it. Okay, so we cut basically the uh, 
the ends off of these planks. That gives me less to work with since roughly measuring, I only needed 67 inches of length, so I cut these to 68. Then we're working with less material. And then we also have fairly chunky ends that are a little bit more useful than if I had ripped these into smaller pieces. And you know whether we wanna use those for cutting boards or whatever, they could come in handy in a, a little bit chunkier size like that than if they were ripped down too narrow. I just wanted to show a quick close up of the difference between this finished blade. It's not even a finished blade, it's a combo blade, but a sharp Tenryu combo blade on the right versus this is a standard blade. You can see this, if you were to use a, a poor blade or a blade that made marks, you'd have to hit that with the jointer in order to have a good joint. But this right side, this is just a table saw blade. That's all I need to do to it to do a glue up and have a perfect scene. And there we have it. All six of our shelf faces ready to go. Slight burn where I paused while I'm cutting, but other than that, that blade just cuts smooth as glass. All right, so next step is gonna be to cut the rough dimensions for the plywood and make sure that any of the edges that we're planning to glue up onto the hardwood that I ripped and prepared earlier is nice and flush and ready to be jointed. I'm gonna do two sheets at a time here, and that just saves a little bit of time. It's one of the advantages of using a track saw. Not only are you not pushing a 80 plus pound piece of plywood, you're, you're moving a five pound saw on a track. And if you don't have one and you do this kind of work, I highly suggest it. Okay, out of this first sheet, I was able to get two bench tops and a single shelf, basically. And I'll go ahead and get the others going now for the rest of the remaining shelves. Okay, so I presented all these parts that we're gonna be using in the orientation that I'm gonna be cutting on them. These are the backs of the two benches and the backs of the shelves. I wanted to make sure that I'm cutting into the not as beautiful side. I don't know if you can tell, but the finish and just the grain on the better side is much nicer, in my opinion. And did the same thing. This, these are the tops of the shelves and I need to orient that because the way that my tool is offset, it's gonna rest here, cut into that, and it's gonna rest on the back here, cut into that, and that'll ensure that the top is pretty much flush with this as well, so we don't have to get into heavy duty sanding and then potentially harm the veneer on the plywood. I'm gonna be using my domino with a five mil bit. It's basically gonna cut a mortise joint for these dominoes on the insides, and I don't need to mark anything because Festool has a cool system that basically, once you make your first cut, you can put these stops into the, the cut you just made and it equally spaces all your cuts the whole way down. And I'll come in from one side and then I'll come in from the other side and go the opposite direction till it meets to the middle. Okay, I've got this mortise, I've got the dominoes in place. I'm gonna spread that glue line and get it clamped on and pinned to this bench top here. Okay, I have this all clamped up, made sure that glue came out of the seam the whole length, and then I pinned two pins per clamp. When, you, when I mean pin, it's a 21 gauge pin. It's very small, it's like the size of a, smaller than a sewing needle. So it's not really visible from the front. You can't really see any, any markings, but I can pull these clamps off now, and the pins will hold it in place until the glue is fully set. Okay, just wanted to show how I'm doing the glue ups. I try to use gravity as much as I can and these, these dominoes are very helpful to, you know, you could basically get a board on them and that's holding the board up. So basically I did this to the other side with the glue, a lot of glue, I just don't like to chintz out on that. And then drop the board on top and I'll do the same on this side. Then I'm gonna flip it over. I'm gonna put a two by four in here so that this side doesn't pull in and I'll use clamps and pin it just like I did with the bench. Okay, all the shelves and the bench tops are glued up. Let those cure overnight, and then I'll get to uh, sanding them down tomorrow. And I do have some extra work on those bench tops before I sand them to get them scribed to where they wanna fit. I'm gonna do that before I do any sanding on those so that I don't have to sand them again. Okay, the shelves are all cured overnight, ready to sand. Now, I wanna make sure that I mark anywhere that I feel the plywood is potentially slightly higher than the hardwood. And I'm, I did a pretty good job yesterday 
you know, making sure that that wasn't the case. But there's a couple spots like right here that I'm going to mark with my pencil. And that's just to basically indicate where I need to be careful with sanding because I don't want to sand through this top veneer. These days, modern hardwoods are only a 64th of an inch thick. That also said, uh, I would typically sand with a more aggressive like 60 grit to get this glue off. Um, but instead, I'm going to use 100 grit. It's going to take a little bit longer, but it's going to give me a little bit more finesse with, again, this top sheet. I don't want to be so aggressive that I'm looking at glue and now I have a worthless piece of work and lumber in front of me. You could go finer than that if you're patient. You could drop, bring it up to a 120 or 150, but it's going to take quite a while to get through this glue. Next thing, I'm going to be spraying with water as I go periodically. I'll basically get through what I think is enough of the glue, and then I'll spray with water, and where the water does not get soaked up, I know that that area needs a little more sanding, and I'll mark that with my pencil as well. And typically, you only want to go sand about as deep as your pencil mark goes before you check again. Otherwise, you might go too deep and, again, ruin that top sheet of your expensive plywood. So we'll see how that looks in a little bit. Okay, I got through that first layer. Let's go ahead and spray it down and see what happens. Looks like it's soaking up water everywhere that I'm spraying. So we're in good shape for our stain. We're not gonna have any weird blotchiness. That's as far as I need to go with the 100 grit and I won't touch it again with sandpaper until I'm ready to fully raise all the grain and drop that grit down to a 150 or a 220. Very hard to see here is there's a split in the grain um, kind of see there's a little crack there so that what I'm gonna do is take a little bit of glue and run this along here on this end and I'll do the other end as well I just take my finger and kind of push it in there because it's lifted up a little bit and I'll do the same on the other end and I'll also use my air compressor and try to blow it in deeper then take a strip of this tape and put the tape where it's dry, pull the tape over with some tension, and in about an hour that should be set up and ready to sand down and that, that piece of wood will stay in place. We'll never even know that happened. Okay, just pull the tape off. Can't even really see it. I'm gonna go ahead and hit it with the sander. Okay, back at the job site after getting the bench tops and the shelves pre-built in my shop, now it's time to scribe. I went in and I measured the angle of that right far corner there and then used a measurement from the left to right in the back, left to right in the front to the tile here, and then measured out how far this is from the back, how far out we need to go there and the angle there. And I had that all scribed onto the top of the lumber and I'm going to cut that with my track saw, which will allow me to get any angle I need and then finish cut with a Japanese handsaw, which works great for just small finishing cuts on uh, straight straight cuts, not curved like you'd need for a jigsaw, but just do, doing straight cuts with that saw. All right, I used my track saw to cut this. It's uh, it's not quite a three inch depth on the saw due to the track being in the way, so I'll, I'll hand saw that out. And got the angle cut on the right side, measured over, and basically just laid that track out on my marks to match the side, you can see this angle here is not quite 90 degrees and that's to match that uh, sort of tapered front we have where it's tiled. I'm gonna go ahead, here's the saw I'm using. They call this the razor saw. These things are great and I'm just gonna get it in there and you can put it up against the side and hold it with your hand and you get a nice, it'll follow that initial cut like so. And it's just a really a lot easier and less messy and makes mistakes much slower than a jigsaw would. So I'm gonna get that cut up and then we're gonna go test fit it. Okay, well that fits just about perfect. Pretty happy with that. I am gonna trim some off the end here. And in fact, I need to put a piece of veneer on the edge here to cover the ply. So I'm gonna cut that in probably about a half an inch and then I'll trim it with a piece of quarter inch just on the inside of this and I'll, I'll cut this piece flush with that, or maybe what I'll do, I might even just cut the whole thing a half inch and then trim the whole piece like so. But yeah, looking good. Never wanna mess those cuts up. I placed a piece of scrap under the track saw back here to make sure that it's supporting the track to make this cut. 
and I squared the track saw off the face here to make this first cut, which is just gonna be going through the face here. And then we're gonna make that other cut along the back and probably hand saw the rest of it so that this piece of plywood detaches itself from the face. Okay, so we got that corner scribe cut and it looks how I want it to. We have this where the final end will ultimately terminate once I put a piece of end grain in there to complete this side. We want a little bit of tile to reveal off the edge. It'll look a little bit more finished than having the wood trying to flush up with that since we don't have a perfectly square profile on there. And after this, we're gonna get on and do the other side, which I won't bore you with since you saw one, but I will show you how I'm gonna mount these shelves that are gonna be up here. We're gonna have one at 48 inches and one at 66. And I'm gonna go ahead and get the cleats on there and get them scribed and cut and test fit and then take them back to the shop to stain. So stay tuned, you're gonna learn some more tricks at the tree. Okay guys, we're gonna put the cleats in. You can see I've got my parallel lines, they're leveled coming out the sides on the stone as well. And the easy way to do this is you get these cut. I like to cut them into, these are two by fours. I ripped down to one and a half inches. You can always get these uh, pre-cut like that at most hardware stores, but in this case, they were just too twisty. These need to be fairly level. Um, the easy way to do this is to use framing nails, three inch with a rib tip so that they grip the, the framing lumber in the wall. But if you don't have a framing nailer, you can always use a finish nailer just to hold these in place while you get some deck screws in there and that'll hold it in place really tight. So these will go up and then basically the shelves are gonna slide over that. And then I have a little tip for getting into tile without having to drill through it. We'll go over that in just a little bit too. I almost forgot, we need to mark our studs. That way I know where to nail when we get the, uh, the boards up. And these are my favorite way to find studs. They're basically just finding with a magnet, the screw that's going into the drywall into the stud behind it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and hit the rest of these and then they'll be marked and they'll go up real quick. Okay, we have the cleats installed. I didn't do the right side yet. I'm gonna do this last. We're gonna get these test fit. There's no sense in trying to finagle over the right side cleat anyway, which obviously I can't do today because the glue is not cured. So I will be able to test fit it with just two sides and get the, um, the shelves cut, pre-cut, and then take them back to the shop. And while those are curing in the shop, uh, I'll have these curing here with the glue that I'm about to show you. All right, first one's in, looks pretty good. Got three more to go. Okay, so here's a little trick. Rather than getting into the masonry bits and relying on not damaging the tile that just went up, I need to get that in place so it can support this shelf. I'm gonna use the strongest bonding polyurethane adhesive I'm aware of. It's, I think, a 24-hour cure, and this stuff is just unbeatable. It has a nice give to it, too, so it's not brittle. And the way that I'm gonna hold that in place while it's setting is with hot glue. So we're gonna get this all heated up. I'm gonna put a small dab of hot glue on either end of this. After I, I guess first I'll put the polyurethane in here, then I'll put a dab of hot hot glue on either end, and then I'll press it up and hold until that hot glue sets. And that hot glue is gonna hold that in place until the polyurethane is cured, and it'll be rock solid by the time I get that shelf up. Okay, we're back in my shop, and as you can see, there's a marking right here, it says fill, because I made the almost fatal mistake of ruining this piece by cutting it too far in that way. I don't even know how that happened after double checking everything, I went and cut, and that's what I got. So. I took some scrap and I cut this out. Now, I do need to file down the inside of this corner a little bit to make it fit. But I'm gonna do that, and then we're gonna make sure this is flush up here, and then this piece is cut to cover this, this end grain here so we don't see that end grain of the plywood. So that'll all get glued and pinned in place. And then when it cures, I'll sand it flush. And I know you can see that grain difference now, but when there's stain on there, I don't think it's really gonna be noticeable. I think it's gonna look great. Reminds me of a time when I was in high school, one of my first projects, and I ran the router bit too high on the first cut. And that router bit just chewed right into my piece that I had already spent like all week working on, and it, <laughs> it just devastated me. I thought it was the end, but the, the shop teacher, Mr. Prude, if you're watching, uh, I still make that mistake, apparently. <laughs> um, but yeah, Mr. Pruitt's tricks worked. It, 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 it was, uh, it's easy to fill mistakes when, when you're working with hardwoods. Uh, not exactly 
fast, but you can, you can repair mistakes and make them almost disappear. All right, there's the glue up. Promise me guys, I mean, I promise you guys it's gonna look a lot better when it's finished. Um, but notice how I overlapped the top of the plywood on both of these, and it doesn't matter that that's long. Once it's all dried up, I can sand that down and cut it to where it needs to be. So the glue's all nice and dried up. Just gonna use my Japanese razor saw and flush it up against this edge here and then get it sanded flush gently with 100 grit sandpaper and then move on to the next. All right, sand it up, looks pretty good. Forgot to mention, I also colored this in with pencil so that I had an indicator of when I was getting too aggressive and once I had already basically flushed up. So you can see a little bit of it left there. You don't wanna go through all the pencil because then that's a sign that you might be getting into your veneers too much. And then after I did that, I, I rounded the corner off just slightly. I just basically broke the edge all the way around, especially important on plywood while you're working with it, even if you're not done with it, just break that edge with sandpaper. It'll prevent it from getting caught on things and potentially delaminating, which could be a real headache. All right, next step we're gonna do here is take this spray bottle and spray down the surface. I'm not gonna do the whole thing while you're watching, just to give you a little sample. And then wipe it up. I like to use these microfiber towels. They're pretty absorbent and they lift the grain up nicely. Don't let it sit on plywood too long because it can actually delam that surface. Uh, if you're doing hardwood, you can let it soak, but I like to wipe it up quick anyway so it doesn't penetrate and it dries faster. What this is gonna do is it's gonna lift the grain on that surface and that way you can knock it down with sandpaper when you go up to your finer grits. So that way when you put your stain on, it doesn't lift up and you get a much smoother final product this way. Sometimes dirt and woods will require a couple times. You need to do this like on alder or some of the more open grain woods, but this is white oak and typically just one pass with the water and the sand will do the job. While I was on the job site, I had a minor delamination while I was test fitting this. This corner popped up, so I, I marked it there to glue it. And what I did is I basically pulled it up with my finger and put this little uh, wedge in there. It's just, just a piece of scrap that serves as a very small shim. It allowed me to get some thing, uh, glue on my finger and rub it in there and then switch sides and do it to both sides. Wipe any uh, excess off the top with a wet rag, clamp it, and then wipe off with your finger pointing down away from the top. And in about 30 minutes, that'll be set up and ready to work with. Okay, all ready for the finished sanding. I'm going to use 150 grit. And depending on the sandpaper you use, you might want to go a little finer, a little more coarse. But with the Festool Granat, that's where I want to be with this. I, being white oak, that should do the trick. It's a pretty hard, solid wood, and it'll feel really smooth. And that 150 grit's going to still let it take in quite a bit of color. And in this case, I want it to. If I was sanding alder, I'd probably bring it up another notch to like 220 because that grain tends to be a little bit more open, and that'll help knock down those lifted grain tips I was mentioning earlier. Got the pencil writing on there, and that's my indicator of when I know enough is enough. And I'm going to get going and listen to some podcasts while I sand down all these pieces. We'll be back in a minute. Okay, this top got fully finished sanded and I'm just gonna take my air compressor and I think you can see in the grain, it, when I blow it, yeah, you can kind of see how it opens up, getting that sawdust out of there. Just gonna do that to the whole thing and that'll help take in grain better. It also makes sure there's no dust in the finish, which can also look a little funky. So a little extra step, well worth it. All right, what I got going here, this is a pre-color, it's called Smoke. And it gives your wood a, just a darker, like a more brown undertone. And this is a Rubio product, <clears throat> which typically is just a one-step process, but this, this requires you to put it on first. And what it does is it penetrates deeper than this top coat that I'm gonna put on. It'll give it more of like an antique aged look. And if you ever look at antique, like shaker furniture, it has a deep, rich tone to it. That's where this comes from. Now don't worry, that's not the final color of the wood. I wouldn't leave it like that. We're gonna put a sort of like a charcoal black top coat over this and it's gonna look really cool when we're all done. All right, once these have sat long enough to be dry, you wanna run your hand on it. If any of the grain is stood back up, which in this case, the plywood feels good, but the hardwood needs a little bit. So I'm taking a 220, just a used disc. No machine on this, because that'll just be too aggressive. And I'm just gonna lightly sand it, just to knock those grain tips down, but not enough to 
get through the color that I put on there. Wouldn't want to do that. All right, I got my <clears throat> top coat mixed up here. This is Rubio Monocoat, zero BOC. This stuff is like pure magic. I love it. I mixed a 50-50 blend of charcoal and black. And then this is the part B, it's a hardener, which accelerates the curing process. Um, technically it's a three to four day process, but usually it's ready to touch within a day. And just stir that up nice and neat. And I'm gonna go ahead and get that poured out on here a little bit at a time and spread it with one of these handy dandy little, I don't know what this is, I guess it's some kind of a wood squeegee, but that saves you a lot of time. Basically you're gonna use this to spread the material and then a microfiber cloth to rub it in with the first pass, we're gonna rub it in with this and then we're gonna wipe it off with that and then a second pass with a clean one. And that'll make a pretty nice satin looking finish. Okay, there's basically the finished product. You can see how that undertone kind of gets into that grain and makes those, these, these parts that are closed grain in between the character, they don't take stain well, so you need a really thin stain to get in there. And then this top coat just puts a nice finish on it. I love Rubio. You still end up getting to see the wood. It still feels like wood. There's still texture where the grain is. And like polyurethane, that basically is just covering it in a sheet of plastic. And uh, I'll do another video on the benefits of Rubio. It's a fantastic product. Anyway, I'm gonna do the rest of these and we'll get those in once they're cured. All right, almost there. We got one left back there. This is the one, I don't remember if you remember earlier, there was one that uh, I cut the board a little short. This is the one. You can't even really tell. I mean, you really have to know what you're looking for and zoom in on it. And I didn't want to cut that out. You see like the only difference is the grain pattern difference. Um, I didn't want to cut that out. I wanted you guys to know how to fix what could be considered a mistake, but if you do it right, it's just part of the character and uh, really unnoticeable. So I'm gonna go get, the, get that one done and then we'll get on these installing tomorrow. And uh, this is day four. So I know sometimes it seems like shelves should only take a little time, but we are over 32 hours into this project and not done. But if you want things done right, this is how you do them. There you have it, that's the final product. We got our shelves in place, we got our benches in place. Turning the corner, just trimming out that tile nicely. Pretty close match to the floor. I think it's a, I think they'll like it. And I think it's gonna look awesome once they, uh, once they get some furniture in here and the TV and all that. Anyway. Hope you guys enjoyed that. If you have questions about the build or you just want to see more, let me know. And uh, please subscribe to the channel and comment, share, like, all that good stuff. I appreciate you watching. Take care.